I'm Julie Richard. I'm the CEO here at Sedona Art Center. I just want to welcome you all here today. Um, I want to acknowledge our season sponsors before we start, the Arizona Commission on the Arts, the Best Western Arroyo Roble Hotel and Greenside Villas, and um, the Clayton Family Foundation. So let's give all of them. So um, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Um, I want to acknowledge our wonderful staff who make all of this happen. Um, Bernadette Carroll is my COO is in the back. Debbie Winslow. <laughs> Debbie Winslow is our school and membership manager. We only have her for about another month and a half. Retiring. And today is my 28th anniversary. <laughs> Kelly Flamenco, our marketing director. And actually, of our gallery associates to our shoulders this year as well. So <laughs> um, we're really proud of this exhibit. We've had uh, so many people make wonderful comments about the show, about it being one of the best, if not the best show they've ever seen at the Art Center, and that is really remarkable. Um, we were incredibly pleased with the uh, entries that we got. We had like 100 and... 200. We had 200 some entries. So we really felt like we got the cream of the crop. Um, and. It's, it's just been really well received, and I'm so glad you're all here to see it and um, to hear Mark and Marie talk a little bit more about surrealism, which is absolutely at our roots. Um, this is our 65th anniversary year, so that's the reason why we decided to do this contemporary surrealism exhibit, because our roots are rooted in surrealism with Max Ernst and Dorothea Tanning, who actually worked here and were part of the beginnings of Sedona Art Center which is pretty amazing. Um, they, let's see. So these are, there's 65 artists in this exhibit. Um, it's up until November 30th, and um, please spread the word and tell your friends more about it. Um, Mark was our judge for the show, so we're really pleased about that. And uh, before you leave, if you could also vote for your People's Choice Award, that would be really great, um, because we are giving a People's Choice Award at the very end for your favorite piece in the show. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Mark up. Um, do all of you know Mark? No. OK, so there you go, Mark. Uh, <laughs> He has um, degrees in art, hist art and art history from Rice University and has helped organize several exhibitions on the history of Max Ernst and Dorothea Tanning in Sedona at Sedona City Hall here in Capricorn Hill. So that's a very, very short bio of yours. Um, you've, he's done so much. He's absolutely the resident expert on Max and Dorothea and knows a heck of a lot about surrealism. So why don't you come on up? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Way out, and I'm actually going to play my presentation. Um, I'm kind of surprised I had Elizabeth to do this, but I gave a presentation for 400 art historians last year at um, the International Society for the Study of Surrealism. It was a virtual event, so um, I had to do it basically like a Zoom meeting. And um, it took me probably three months to get maybe two hours of talk down to 20 minutes, so you'll be spared a lot by watching this. But I covered most of it. One of the threads that I was following when I was preparing this paper, which I don't think is, I know it's been somewhat understood, but I don't think it's been fully understood, is there actually is a linkage between Northern Arizona and the modern art movement in a very central way. And the story actually begins with Carl Jung. Carl Jung came to meet with a Hopi elder in the 1920s. Uh, someone he thought was a Hopi elder. Turns out from another Hopi, I was reading a critique of the meeting. It was a Hopi who was a friend of D.H. Lawrence's. He wasn't an elder, but nonetheless, it was a very transformational encounter for Jung. And 
Um, Jung was actually an artist, and many people don't realize that. And here's a piece of art from his book, which was only released a dozen years ago, called The Red Book. And um, he was studying dream imagery, dream therapy, and he was doing such a deep dive into dreaming that he thought he'd gone mad. So this book was his attempt to find his way back to sanity through art and through his own. And here's a piece of art he did that was influenced by Paul. So, um, so, you know, thinking about that for a moment, the Surrealists were, were very heavily influenced by Freud and by Jung, and the dive into the unconscious mind, the collective unconscious. But here we have the Hopi influencing those theories. So, um, I don't think that's ever been very much explored, but they were all aware of this publication, which I'm sure everyone here knows about, by Curtis, which, this is the volume on the Hopi. And so there's a lot of information, a lot of photographs. When Curtis was, you know, documenting their history and photographing them, and the Surrealists all read this, they all started collecting Hopi art artifacts in the 20s. There was actually an exhibition in 1942 in New York called The First Papers of Surrealism that Duchamp organized. And every piece of Surrealist art was paired with a piece of Hopi artwork, or a kachina. And so those didn't make it into the catalog, I presume because the Hopi probably didn't want their work photographed. But um, when Max and Dorothea came here, you know, a lot of people will take for granted it had to do with the surrealist landscape, and I'm sure that was a big part of it. But the other big part of it was the Hopi. So um, when Max and Dorothea would get visits from their world famous artist friends, I mean, First time I came here in 43, and I talk about this in the video, there were, Max said there were only 16 people living in Sedona. And so he was staying at Shakea Ranch, which is what we call Tlacopaki today. And that was out of town, because town was just where the post office was. <laughs> so, um, so at any rate, well, you know, one of the attractions to coming here for them was they felt like they had 10 times the energy to paint than they ever had in New York. But the other attraction, was you know, the Native American tribes in the region. So what would they do when their friends would come visit? They would take them to the pueblos. And so if you read the memoirs of Lee Miller and Roland Penrose, and Roland Penrose's book, he said the highlight of the trip was going to the Hopi pueblos and, and watching all the ceremonial dances. And, and a lot of people don't know that Breton came here in 1945 on his own in August when the war was ended. He spent three weeks at the Pueblos and taking notes like an anthropologist, maybe. It was on a photograph. He wasn't really supposed to take notes, but he did take notes. And those notes hit the auction market a few years ago. Kate Conley has written you know, an essay, I think he's working on a book about that. But anyway, just to give you an idea, when Max and Dorothea came here, and I was kind of knowing here, um, it was their remote studio. And they would paint, and Dorothea wrote in her book eight times, they'd pack up the trailer in the car and they'd get it back to New York. And where would they show? They would show up Julian Levy Gallery. And we happen to have the director at the foundation here, who's been director almost 40 years. This woman knows more than anyone about this part of surrealism history than anyone on the planet. And I'm going to give a plug for her book. She's Got a new book coming out on the 28th. It's 2,200 pages. It took 15 years. Weighs 20 pounds. <laughs> uh, it's four volumes. You can find it on Amazon. And I'm not sure she'll she'll tell you much more about that. But I'll give you a short list of some of the people yes. that came to Sedona to visit Max and Dorothea, and it was much more influential than people realized who started this place. So Max and Dorothea were in the opening exhibition. And they were friends with the founder, Nassan Gabran, who used to stay in their house and watch the Picassos and the art collection and they traveled. So uh, among the people that came here and visited, these are, these are my notes for my talk. Lee <laughs> <laughs> Miller, Roland Penrose, Man Wright, Julia Browner, Yves Tanguy, Case Sage, Andre cartier Bresson, Frederick Sommer, Dylan Thomas, Gavikov, William Coakley, and many more I'm probably leaving out. I've heard that Stravinsky may have come here, and Peggy may have even come here. I haven't been able to verify any one of those. So, 
Uh, I'll just mention also this book, um, Autobiography uh, of a Healthy Indian. And Don, and I don't want to mess up this last name, but I guess I'll try it, Taliyispa. Um, he presided over the soil ceremony uh, at Haribi for three decades by the time Max and Dorothea were here. So I think there's a pretty high probability that they met him. Um, presiding over one of the ceremonies, and you'll see my mention of that in the video that Dorothy paints a painting that actually references one of those ceremonies. But at any rate, um, so Tom met this guy. This guy actually flew to France and they became friends. And that's just a little taste of how embedded Billy and Hopi were, were in the movement in so many ways. At the very first exhibition, of the Betty Parsons grand opening of her gallery was Peggy Guggenheim kind of fled New York, which she sort of needed to do after her tell-all book called um, <laughs> Out of the Century. Um, she, she, it's a great book if you haven't read it. And one thing I love about Peggy is she doesn't edit. She says lots of unflattering things about herself, which anyone who's being careful about their legacy probably wouldn't say. But she also said that about every, everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the reason largely that she went to Venice and left New York was she wasn't very popular. <laughs> but that book had a lot to do with Max and Dorothea coming to Sedona and buying land and building a house. Because Max felt like it ruined him in New York because there were two chapters about Max in the book. So, so at any rate, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start this. Uh, I'll John over my name. Greetings from Capricorn Hill. Dorothea Tanning, Early Influences in Sedona. While the influence of Native American art and culture on Max Ernst's artwork during his time in Arizona has been a subject of great interest, little has been explored about similar influences on the early work of Dorothea Tanning during her formative years in Sedona. At the time of Max and Dorothea's first stay in Sedona in 1943, Dorothea recalled it was so scarcely populated it couldn't even be described as a village. In Max's biographical notes, he shared memories of their stay and noted only 16 people lived in Sedona at the time. Yet Max and Dorothea had entered a landscape that had been previously inhabited by Native Americans for millennia. Verde Valley shows archaeological evidence of inhabitation over 10,000 years ago. The multitude of red rock ruins suggest a Native American population once in the thousands. However, the sites were abandoned in the 1400s for reasons which are a matter of some mystery, well before the arrival of Spanish explorers in 1540 and 1583. Some have speculated it was due to an extended drought, while others suggest that it was simply Hopi migration. Certain locations are considered sacred by the Hopi, Navajo, and Yavapai Apache, and feature prominently in their oral histories, mythologies, and ceremonies, which have been passed down for centuries. Jesse Walter Fuchs explored sites and ruins in the region in 1895 and published reports with the Smithsonian. Edward Curtis visited the Hopi Pueblos northeast of Sedona many times between 1900 and 1919 and photographed the Hopi extensively. Many Hopi legends and mythologies, as well as his photographs, were published in Volume 12 of the North American Indian in 1922. Shakea Ranch, the guest ranch, where Max and Dorothea rented cottages in 1943 as temporary studio spaces, was owned and operated by artist Lillian Wilhelm Smith. Lillian had already been exploring and painting Native American sites and ceremonies in Arizona for 30 years. Best known as Zane Gray's illustrator, she first came to Arizona in 1913 to paint illustrations for writers of the Purple Sage. Lillian was of German descent, and had been considered a child prodigy. She had studied at the National Academy of Design, the Art Student League, Columbia University, and the Leonia School of Art. Lillian was believed to be the first Anglo woman to have traveled to certain remote areas of northern Arizona, including Havasu Falls. Prior to opening her guest ranch in Sedona in 1937, she operated a guest ranch and trading post by the same name on Navajo lands northeast of Flagstaff. There she offered visits to the Hopi Pueblos to witness dances and ceremonies, as well as week-long tours of hidden canyons and ruins. The dining hall boasted views of the snow-capped San Francisco peaks in the distance.
While Lillian often painted locations central to Native American legends in the region, her paintings were representational of the landscape and the setting. Here's an image of Lillian painting Plein Air, a photograph of her accompanying Zane Gray on a journey to Rainbow Bridge in 1922. There's a photo of her painting Rainbow Bridge, and this is the painting. According to Navajo legend, the arch was formed by a male and female rainbow person coming together in union and frozen in time. Next is an image of a Kachina dance, which Lillian painted in 1925. Lillian's guest ranch in Sedona was on land originally owned by Sedona's namesake, Sedona Schneebly's family. Sedona's home functioned as the town's original hotel, post office, and general store. The original home was lost to a fire and the property later purchased by George Black, who built a small stone home called the Stone House at that location. In 1937, Lillian purchased the property and she named it Shakea Ranch. Lillian's husband, Jesse, built the rustic cottages, which Max and Dorothea rented. Her cottages rented for $100 per month or $250 for three months. Without lights or running water in the cottages, Max and Dorothea likely joined Lillian for meals in the main house. Lillian was a direct descendant of 17th century German polymath Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, an important figure in the history of mathematics, science, and philosophy, which of course was of great interest to Max and a source of inspiration for his painting Vox Angelica, with its many Leibnizian references. Max later recalled how they first learned of the guest ranch from a fellow exile, and noted in considerable detail the landscape, the wildlife, and plant life of Oak Creek Canyon, as well as the hospitality of several Indian tribes, including the Hopi. Max and Dorothea's relationship had begun only a few months prior to their 1943 Sedona adventure. Dorothea had left her illustration job at Macy's to focus on painting full-time. Dorothea later recalled that when Max moved into her apartment, along with him came an army of Gachinas, which he had acquired at the Grand Canyon Trading Post during his first trip through Arizona in 1941, many of them originally from the Hopi Pueblos northeast of Sedona. Native American art had recently been featured in two major exhibitions in New York. In the spring of 1941, the MoMA featured the exhibition Indian Art of the United States. In mid-October 1942, the exhibition First Papers of Surrealism opened, featuring Native American artworks displayed alongside Surrealist artworks. Unsure of their next move after the 31 Women exhibition, Max and Dorothea decided to leave New York and head to Sedona to paint. Dorothea would later recall that her life experience was as if it could have been split in two before and after Arizona. Many of her early paintings from Sedona would soon be exhibited at her first solo exhibition at Julian Levy Gallery the following year. Yet Dorothea included only a few lines about her first experience in Sedona in 1943, in birthday and in between lives. In birthday, she recalled, at first it was to be a way to spend the summer. A landscape of such wild fantasy could not, however, be classified and forgotten when summer was over. Less than three years later, we were back to stay. More than just summer, postcards from Max to photographer friend Frederick Sommer reflect that they stayed in Sedona well into October. While Dorothea may have written few details in her books, her artworks offer clues as to the locations and sites they visited, as well as their associated Native American mythologies. Cathedral Rock, which Dorothea mentions briefly in Birthday, is one of the most iconic red rock formations in Sedona, arguably the most photographed spot by tourists. The entrance to the park is known today as Crescent Moon Ranch, on the west side of Cathedral Rock. A century ago, it was a large orchard, cannery operation, and produced fruit and vegetables and grain sold over a wide region. In 1936, the Baldwin family acquired the property and installed a large water wheel for irrigation and domestic use. The water wheel is a landmark familiar to tourists today near the entrance to the trail alongside Oak Creek. Dorothea's drawing, Simplified Botany, The Land, 1943, shows the recognizable landmark, the water wheel near Cathedral Rock. The drawing also accurately renders the water level of the irrigation channel. Only a half mile to the east of Cathedral Rock is one of Sedona's most popular hikes, Cathedral Rock Trail. Views to the southeast toward Courthouse Butte show evidence of Sedona's geologic past. 
the red rocks having been sculpted by currents while beneath the ocean multiple times, as well as having been flooded once by fresh water, the reason the rocks are red. Her painting Self-Portrait, 1944, was not painted plein air as Lillian painted her landscapes, nor was it painted from a photograph. Rather, Dorothea's surreal version of the Sedona landscape was painted from memory the next year back in New York. A sole female figure stands before a flooded canyon in the Red Rock landscape and may be a reference to the legend of Wittipokwe and the flood of Palakawapi, ancient mythologies of Native Americans in the Sedona region. The area where Shakea Ranch once stood was developed in the 1970s into an arts village and a resort. It was originally built as an art community, a combination of gallery spaces and artists in residence. Today it's a collection of over 50 shops, galleries, and restaurants, and a highly popular destination for the millions of tourists that visit Sedona annually. The renovated stone house, visible in early photographs of Shakea Ranch, and seen in the western film Gunfighters, still stands today at Los Abrogados Resort and is available as a rental. A short walk to the creek from the stone house shows the location where Dorothea's photo was taken at Shakea Ranch in 1943. In Arizona Landscape, 1943, Dorothea references the red rock formation visible across the creek from Shakea Ranch, however reverses the image orientation as a horizontal flip, as if a photo negative. Arizona Landscape appears to combine imagery from two different locations. The body of water resembles photographs of Montezuma Well. Katrina Makara mentions in A Surrealist Stratigraphy of Dorothea Tanning's Chasm, the possibility that the body of water in the painting is a reference to Montezuma Well. A natural limestone sinkhole 18 miles south of Shakea Ranch, it produces a flow of 1.5 million gallons of water per day from an underground spring. Ruins at the site date back to the year 1050. In 1895, Jesse Walter Fuchs recorded his observations for the Smithsonian from his expedition to Arizona. He learned of the legends of Montezuma Well from Hopi elders at Walpi and speculated that the well may have been the home of Palulican, the mythic Hopi water serpent who destroyed Palakawabi with a flood. In 1896, Fuchs published an article in American Anthropologist about two sites located near the area that would become known as Sedona, two ruins recently discovered in the Red Rock Country, Arizona. The two sites of Red Rock cliff dwellings had been inhabited from the years 1150 to 1350. He named them Hananki and Palatki, with Palatki being named after the fabled red-walled city Palakawabi of Hopi legends, which had been destroyed by flood. Edward Curtis first visited the Hopi villages in 1900, photographing the Hopi people, and then returned six more times between 1902 and 1919. In 1922, a series of 20 volumes were published, with Volume 12 focused on the history, mythologies, and ceremonies of the Hopi. Page 128 describes the Soyal Winter Solstice Ceremony. Page 240 references the Flood of Palakawapi. According to A History of the Well by park ranger Jack Beckman, Montezuma Well is frequently visited by Hopi, Navajo, and local Yavapai Apache, who consider it a very sacred site. Some collect water for ceremonies, some come to pray, lead prayer feathers, sprinkle sacred cornmeal, or throw water over their shoulders toward the north in the direction of home and needed rain. In Arizona landscape, the imagery of the waterfall flowing forth from the top of her head may not only be a reference to the spring that flows forth from Montezuma Well, but also what is known in Hopi as the Kopavi, Frank Waters in Book of the Hopi describes Kopavi in this way in Chapter 1, The First World. The first of these in man lay at the top of the head. Here, when he was born, was the soft spot, Kopavi, the open door through which he received his life and communicated with his creator. Jack Beckman wrote down the Apache creation legend of Wittipokwe, which he heard often repeated by Yavapai Apache visiting Montezuma Well. Montezuma Well flooded the world, and only one person was left, a girl, Wittipokwe. 
She floated in a canoe until she came to a cave where she decided to live. She had a daughter whose father was the son. The daughter produced a son. This was the beginning of the Apache people. In Dorothea's artwork, Fantastic Heliotherapy, a young girl escapes the flood by climbing a Pueblo ladder, which leads to an opening in a sunflower as if a portal into a Pueblo. The imagery suggests her surrealist version of the legend of Wittipoque, with the sun represented by a sunflower and a girl who appears to be pregnant, impacted by rays of sunlight. An account of the Wittipoque creation story of the southeastern Yavapai was published in American Archaeology and Ethnology in 1932 by E.W. Gifford and includes several additional local details. Wittipoque survived the flood as her hollowed-out pine tree canoe became stranded on San Francisco Mountain. She went south to the Red Rock Country on the east side of the Verde River across from Jerome. There, she bore a daughter begotten by the sun. Interestingly, as the legend might suggest, the Navajo, Yavapai Apache, and Hopi are matrilineal societies. Among the Hopi, women own the property, and Hopi clans rise and fall with the generations of female heirs. Concerning the title, heliotherapy is the therapeutic use of sunlight for healing of certain health conditions. Between 1880 and 1945, Arizona was the most popular destination in the U.S. prescribed for heliotherapy. In Dorothea's painting Rapture, 1944, the sun is represented as a sunflower radiating light over a landscape reminiscent of the view of Verde Valley towards Sedona as seen from Jerome. Interestingly, Lillian Wilhelm Smith was credited as the first artist to paint a view of Verde Valley from Mingus Mountain. The sunflower as sun suggests Native American representations of Tawa, the sun kachina, creator of the first world. Here's an image of Tawa, the sun spirit kachina. Most Hopi creation stories center around Tawa, the sun spirit. Tawa is the creator, and it was he who formed the first world out of endless space, as well as its original inhabitants, Harold Coolander, the fourth world of the Hopi. There were other friends in Max and Dorothea's sphere, in addition to Lillian, who had interaction with Native Americans in the region. Helen Fry, a close friend of Max and Dorothea's, built a large home southwest of Cathedral Rock, reminiscent of a Hopi Pueblo, and filled her home with a collection of Native American art and artifacts. Here's a photograph of Dorothea holding up Kachina uh, next to Max and possibly Jimmy partying at Helen Fry's home. Helen's home was built by local Yavapai Apache workers and became known as the House of Apache Fires. She was often visited by the Hopi, Navajo, as well as Yavapai Apache. Helen was invited to ceremonies that were not open to the public and reportedly had sacred ceremonies performed at her home. Helen's home in Acreage eventually became Red Rock State Park. Photographs from Patrick Walbird's visit in January 1947 show that Max began construction of sections of Capricorn at Helen Fry's home until the problem of water was solved at Capricorn Hill that summer. Andre Bertone had made a trip to the Hopi Mazes in Arizona for three weeks in August 1945. Bertone logged detailed notes in the manner of an anthropologist recording observations of ceremonies and dances. He reported that 1,000 visitors witnessed the serpent dance at Walpi. When Lee Miller and Roland Penrose visited Capricorn Hill in the summer of 46, Max and Dorothea took them to the Hobie Pueblos to watch ceremonial dances and rituals. Of the visit, Roland wrote, Most impressive of all was the Hopi Reservation, where from a housetop we joined in the compulsive rhythms of the masked Kachina dancers. Max had already made friends with the Hopi and had a splendid collection of some of their most extraordinary Kachina dolls. In Birthday, Dorothea recounts the story of a return to Arizona from a long trip to France and winding their way across the U.S. by car. In New Mexico, they visited the Acoma Pueblo, and for the price of a dollar, they witnessed a dance at sunset of masked dancers and tribesmen, surrounded by women, children, and the elderly of the village.
The year before Max and Dorothea first came to Sedona, Sun Chief, the autobiography of a Hopi Indian, was published in 1942. Hopi Sun Chief, Don Taliesfa, was from Aribi, the ancient Hopi village in northern Arizona that's been continuously inhabited since the year 1150. Don was the Sun Chief of the Fire Clan and had overseen the Soyal ceremony for 30 years by the time Sun Chief was published. Due to the number of researchers and anthropologists he cooperated with, he became known as anthropology's most documented man. Sun Chief reported a dream to anthropologist Dorothy Egan that he would become known in Europe. He would later have a thriving correspondence with Breton after his life story was translated and published in Europe. Among Max Ernst's book collection, donated by Dorothea to the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale, was a copy of Sun Chief, which had been translated into French. Max was also known to have read Fuchs' research on Native American history in Arizona and his study of Kachinas. The Truth About Comets, 1945. The landscape is a reference to the San Francisco peaks north of Flagstaff. San Francisco Mountain is a stratovolcano, and Dorothea clearly illustrates the volcanic cone. For the Hopi, the peaks are a sacred site, home to their ancestral Kachina spirits who live on the peaks and among the clouds near the summit from summer until the winter solstice. At the winter solstice soyal ceremony, the Kachinas dance in celebration of the sun returning toward its summer path. The Hopi determine when the winter solstice arrives by using the alignment of the sun with the San Francisco peaks. The two comets in the Truth About Comets likely represent Kachinas above the sacred peaks and may also be a reference to certain Hopi prophecies. A reference to Comet Kachinas at the Kachina House in Sedona states, The Chasing Star Kachina is also called the Comet Kachina and Planet Kachina. The Hopi differ in regard as to what this Kachina represents. Some say he represents a planet. To others, he represents a meteor streaking across the sky. Chasing Star usually appears at the Bean Dance or at a Mixed Dance. His function is no longer known. The images of two females, described as mermaid figures by Dorothea's friend Joseph Cornell, might be a reference to the snake maiden of the Hopi snake myth. The staircase appears to draw from two images by Edward Curtis, the stairway trail and on a housetop, photographed at the Hopi village Walpi, published in the North American Indian, Volume 12, in 1922. Dorothea's artwork, A Guest, the costume design for The Night Shadow, a ballet in 1945, appears reminiscent of the Hopi deer dancer Kachina. Dorothea's book illustration for three plays, published by Black Sun Press in 1944, appears reminiscent of a Hopi eagle dancer. Thank you. And so I went two minutes over time for that presentation because I was only allowed 20 anyway. So <laughs> that's a, a great place to stop. Uh, as far as introducing Brie, I guess we've been corresponding for six years, maybe? Yeah, at least. Seven years. At least. When I started this deep dive into trying to understand Max and Dorothea's history here, I decided that I would start with the paintings. So I started studying the very first paintings they did in 1943. So I tried to find where all these paintings were. And I started corresponding with museums around the globe that had them. And found out a lot of them didn't know very much about what they had. They didn't know much about the history of, of what they painted here, to be honest. And they started asking me questions, like, well, who am I? You know, I'm just trying to find this out. So uh, that led me into talking to all kinds of art historians that were writing books on the subjects and then, you know, bothering people at foundations. So there was really this great resource sitting back there in Connecticut now, Julian Levy, it, it's hard to comprehend how important he really was to the Surrealism movement and the modern art movement. But when the center of the art world shifted from Paris to New York, there was Julian Levy, who had been showing Surrealism since the 30s, but all the Surrealists came to his doorstep. And so they, they had all evacuated Europe, and now here they all are in New York. 
And, and here's Max, and, and who's this boy Thea, this new painter? And, and so um, all the ongoing you know, exhibitions at Julian Lee Gallery literally set the stage for the modern art movement in very many ways. Mark Rothko used to go there. He'd go there with Milton Avery, and they would look at the shows. And everyone went there. And from what I understand, um, Julian Levy is credited with uh, founding what we consider modern art where you come together on an evening and you all have some wine and some good drink. <laughs> you're all having a great time talking about the art, hopefully buying something. That was Julian Levy. That might be one of his biggest legacies. <laughs> so, uh, so at any rate, I have gone to my go-to resource here, and, and Marie, God bless her, you know, I asked her a question none of the art historians could answer, and she's like, well, let me go check on the files. And then sure enough, a day or two later, well, I found this letter, and it says this. So she's been my secret weapon, and I'm grateful to finally be here, and so I'll just turn it over to her. And um, I definitely would like to acknowledge my co-author, Beth Gates Warren, who lives in the Santa Barbara, California. Uh, we collaborated by Coastal for 15 years to put this book together, so I'm sure she would love to be here today, too. Uh, Mark asked me <laughs> to give you a little bit of my surreal story. Um, I have um, a degree in history not art history. I have no art historian credentials. And when my youngest daughter was a freshman in high school, I thought I would find a part-time job. And I saw an ad in our little weekly newspaper in Connecticut. And it said this person was looking for Someone who could do word processing. That's how long ago this was. It was 1985. And it said, unique environment and flexible hours. Well, I wanted to go to my daughter's swim meets. Sounded perfect. So I went up to interview, did a little <clears throat> resume, and I walked into this beautiful old colonial house that was built in 1799. Uh, Gene must have been, Gene Farley Levy was Julian's third wife. Um, he passed away in 81, so she, uh, you know, was still getting used to not having Julian around. Anyway, she had skin tight black leather pants, a beautiful woman, and there was all this weird art, kind of looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, um, well, okay. I literally, I didn't know about Julian Levy. Um, I didn't know much about surrealism at all. Anyway, um, so I gave her my resume, and she said, well, I have a lot of applicants. I'll be calling, you know, and letting people know. And the next morning, my phone rang. And it was Jane, and she said, could you start tomorrow? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I was impressed with myself. And I thought she was, you know. I did a great job. Come to find out, she did every applicant's astrological charts, <laughs> and mine fit with hers the best. And here I am, almost 40 years later, she passed away in 2003, and I am still working on it. <laughs> for her. So that's my quick story. Um, before I begin my presentation about the women, uh, I would just briefly like to acquaint you with Julian and the Julian Levy Gallery. When Julian Levy opened his gallery in 1931, he was a 25-year-old Harvard dropout, the husband of Mina Loy's daughter, Joella, and the father of two young boys. He was also an aspiring writer and a risk taker, either eager to pit his iconoclastic ideas against the prevailing social norms. An incredibly complicated and mercurial man. He could be charming or rude, generous or stingy, insecure or arrogant. It was his good fortune, however, to possess a brilliant mind, a knack for showmanship, and a determination to champion the new and different. 
qualities that allow him to chart an unorthodox course through the often treacherous terrain of New York City's art world. Two months after opening the Julian Levy Gallery, Julian made history when he mounted an exhibition of surrealist art that immediately secured his reputation as a provocateur. From there, he proceeded, proceeded to launch artist after artist, many of them Europeans unknown to American curators and collectors. In 1936, he published his book, Surrealism, in which he explained, as he used to say, Surrealism <laughs> is a point of view and as such applies to painting, literature, photography, cinema, politics, architecture, play, and behavior. Taking his own definition to heart, he dedicated himself to showing all forms of art created by all sorts of people. During the 18 years that his gallery was active, he showcased a diverse selection of works and mounted solo exhibitions for more than 115 artists. An amazing roster of names few art dealers could ever hope to equal. One New York Times art critic admiringly dubbed him a maestro of the art world. To the dismay of Julian's real estate developer father, Making money was never his eldest son's main objective. Julian was pleased when an artist's work sold well, and as long as his gallery broke even, he was content. As far as he was concerned, one of the most enjoyable and meaningful aspects of owning a gallery was the congenial environment it provided for spirit, spirited, aesthetic, and intellectual discussions among the artists, writers, musicians, and chess aficionados who convened there. By the late 1940s, for a number of reasons, Julian became disillusioned with the art world. In 1949, he closed his gallery and retired to a farmhouse in Connecticut with his second wife, artist Miriam Streeter. When they too went their separate ways, it was thanks to his third wife, the former Jean Farley McGonagall, that Julian finally succeeded in conquering his addiction to alcohol. From then on, he enjoyed a highly productive second career, writing, teaching, and lecturing about surrealism to a whole new generation of students, museum goers, and art collectors. One of Julian's most noteworthy accomplishments that has long gone, gone unacknowledged was the fact that between November 1931 and mid-April 1949, Julian mounted 30 solo exhibitions for 24 women artists, some of whom did not use their real names because they knew museums and collectors were reluctant to purchase any artwork created by a woman. Levy's willingness to recognize and promote their work becomes even more salient compared to the Museum of Modern Art's exhibition history during those same years when only three women were given solo exhibitions. <laughs> so today I want to try and introduce you to these 24 amazing women. Um, due to time constraints, it's kind of going to be like speed dating. <laughs> so hopefully um, some I couldn't you know, elaborate on as much as I would have liked. But um, I will present them in the chronological order of their first appearance at the Levy Gallery. When Julian Levy visited Paris in the spring of 1927, he befriended photographer Bernice Abbott and engaged her to take his portrait. Abbott relocated to New York City in 1930 and in September 1932, Levy opened the fall season of his gallery with photographs by Berenice Abbott, her first solo exhibition in the United States. Abbott's documentation of the disappearing buildings and historic byways of New York City prompted critics to compare the images, her images of Gotham to Eugene Adjaye's photographs of Paris. Elizabeth Miller was born in 1907 in Poughkeepsie, New York. In the late 1920s, she began using the name Lee, 
a variant of one of her childhood nicknames because it was sexually ambiguous. In 1929, Miller traveled to Paris where her intention was to become Man Ray's assistant. Mm -hmm. They developed both a personal and a professional relationship, mm -hmm. but by the spring of 1932, they were no longer together. In May, when Julian arrived in Paris on a buying trip, he wasted no time in taking advantage of Miller's availability. After a summer fling, Levy returned to New York City determined to mount an exhibition of Miller's work. And on December 30th, 1932, Miller's photographs went on view at the Levy Gallery. The press release proclaimed, the new light on the horizon of photography is Miss Lee Miller, who went to Paris to study painting, but discovered instead the contemporary medium of photography. Levy prepared an attractive brochure titled Lee Miller, Exhibition of Photographs, which was printed on rosy pink paper stock and featured a simplified drawing of a camera and tripod on the cover. Lee Miller's show at the Julian Levy Gallery was her first and only solo show in her lifetime. If you can believe that now. <laughs> Throughout her life, Mina Loy identified herself foremost as a painter, but she was also a groundbreaking poet and a writer. She has been labeled as futurist, Dadaist, surrealist, feminist, and modernist, and she was also Julian Levy's mother-in-law. When Julian and his wife Joella decided to open an art gallery in New York City in 1931, Mina agreed to act as an agent in establishing a dependable channel of communication between her artist friends in Paris and the Levy Gallery. On January 28, 1933, Julian gave Mina Loy her first painting exhibition in the United States. Paintings by Mina Loy consisted of 11 works, all of them done in shades of blue, that gave them an otherworldly, mystical atmosphere. The blue paper catalog cover featured a simple line drawing of two faces, four upraised hands, and four stars, all simplified versions of elements that appeared in Mina's paintings. Although Julian was willing to mount another show of Mina's work, her canvases never materialized. In February of 1934, a sculpture by Helene Sardot opened at the Julian Levy Gallery. A native of Belgium, Sardot's showing consisted of more than 45 works in six different mediums. Frank Crownshield, the legendary Condé Nast editor, wrote a laudatory essay for the exhibition brochure, which was printed on vivid pink paper stock and mailed to gallery goers in a matching pink envelope. <laughs> in 1923, Photographer Martha Wynne Richards dropped her given name and began using the androgynous Wynne Richards. Richards was best known for her portraits of fashionable women, so it is not surprising that her Levy Gallery showing in April 1934 was titled Exhibition of Photographs of Women Prominent in Fashion. Alice Hughes at the New York American noted, these 48 images are photos of women who have muscled their way into men's fields and established themselves as authorities to be reckoned with. They are powerful, sure of themselves, intelligent. Many are at the top of their success. Cora Elizabeth Berry, ending with a Y, was born in Chicago in 1898, but according to her Levy Gallery press release, Corinna DeBerry, ending with an I, was born 10 years later in 1908 <laughs> in Nice, France, <laughs> to a Florentine father and a French-English mother. <laughs> I could go on and on here. Um, DeBerry also claimed to have been married to an Italian count, giving her the right to use the title Countess. Yet, the Auburn haired beauty would continue freely embellishing her past for the rest of her life. 
Paintings by Corinna de Berry went on display at the Julian Levy Gallery in November 1934. The show included 30 paintings, many of them completed during the summer de Berry spent in Rockport, Massachusetts, with Italian-born sculptor Antonio Salemme. De Berry worked in bright, strong colors and applied her paint in thick, impasto passages. The reviewers were generally kind in their comments, especially the male critics who were entranced by her. <laughs> by the time Leonor Fini and Julian Levy met in Paris in June 1936, Fini had participated in several group exhibitions all over Europe, and word of her success as a portraitist had spread. Also known for her outrageous behavior, she fully lived up to her reputation and Julian's expectations. He would later describe her as a woman whose parts did not fit well together. <laughs> Head of a lioness, as you can see. Mind of a man, bust of a woman, torso of a child, grace of an angel, and discourse of the devil. <laughs> Shortly before Julian's departure from France, he and Leonor traveled to Normandy, and when they finally parted ten days later, Julian settled away with pleasant memories of a casual summer dalliance. <laughs> Leonor, however, was still infatuated with Julian and sent him love letters, which were inadvertently forwarded to his wife, Joella, <laughs> who was summering in New England with, with the uh -huh. least three sons. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yes, so um, despite the strain this caused on the Levy's marriage, Julian proceeded to make plans to show Feeney's work concurrently with Max Ernst's in November 1936. Although she had misgivings about seeing Julian again, Feeney made the voyage to New York City to be present for her first solo exhibition in the United States. Titled simply Leonor Feeney Paintings, 10 canvases and 11 of her automatic drawings were on display. Her exhibition catalog was similar to Ernst's and included contributions from poet Paul Eluard and painter Giorgio de Chirico. Although Feeney was disappointed with her exhibition, she later agreed to have a second show at the Levy Gallery. Recent paintings, Leonor Feeney went on view in February 1939 and the 14 paintings shown were earthy, provocative, and sometimes humorous. Art News reported that her ladies air their smoothly painted neuroses, which will undoubtedly entertain the spectator as much as they entertain the artist. Her craftsmanship is fine, her pattern is sometimes delightful, and her ability as a port portraitist is unquestionably excellent. Julian Levy showed Alice Halika's work in early February 1938, perhaps at the urging of her friend, the neo-romantic artist Leonie Berman, whose exhibition was partially concurrent with hers. Halika's exhibition of paintings and romance cacatume focused on a group of 20 collages from her Quilted Romances series. One of the collages in the show was lent by Catherine Dreyer, and subsequently gifted to Yale University Art Gallery, where it remains today. Odalesque, or Arabian Nights, is meticulously crafted, using the Trapunto quilting technique to give the tableau three-dimensionality. Incorporated into the collage are newspaper clippings, passages of decoupage, bits of braid and lace, swatches of patterned silks and satins, and cuttings of human hair coaxed into miniature coiffures. Florence Nambour Kane was already a well-respected art educator when paintings by Florence Kane opened at the Julian Levy Gallery on February 9, 1938. The majority of the 21 oil paintings on display were those painted during her recent travels to Mexico and Guatemala, and Levy was successful in selling seven of Kane's paintings. Okay. On September 26, 1938, paintings by Gracie Allen opened at the Levy Gallery. Julian touted the purported artistic skills of Gracie Allen, radio star and wife of comedian George Burns. Called a mad Michelangelo with the mind of a surrealist and the skills of a professional dope, 
Alan played her role to the hilt, titling her paintings with nonsensical phrases such as, Man with my fright wounds over a manicurist, <laughs> and ingenuously boasting that she must be a genius. It was all lighthearted farce concocted for publicity's sake to raise money for medical aid for Chinese refugees. Nine months later, the story of Gracie Allen's traveling art exhibition reached an entirely new level of absurdity. When an article in the Athens, Ohio Messenger revealed that the paintings exhibited by Levy and promoted as Gracie Allen's handiwork had been created by a very broke Hollywood artist who was paid five dollars per painting by Allen's crafty publicity agent. Oh. Okay. Of all the artists Julian Levy represented, Frida Kahlo seems to have been the one he most admired. Surprisingly, though, very few of the voluminous books and articles written about Kahlo emphasize just how important her exhibition at the Levy Gallery was in building her reputation as an artist. It is difficult to believe, given how famous she is today, but the fact is that Levy mounted her first and only solo exhibition in the United States during her lifetime. <laughs> Kahlo and Levy began corresponding near the end of 1937, and in mid-February 1938, Kahlo excitedly told a friend that Levy wanted to show her paintings in an autumn exhibition. Of course, Levy's initial plan had been to mount a joint exhibition for Diego Rivera and Kahlo, but when Rivera announced that he would not be ready in time, Levy reassured Kahlo that he still wanted to proceed with her display. At Levy's request, Kahlo sent a brief summary of her life, telling him, I never had any exhibition before. I was always shy and afraid to show my things. I never knew I was a surrealist until Andre Breton came to Mexico and told me I was one. <laughs> I myself still don't know what I am. The only thing I know is that I paint because I need to. They also discussed how her name should appear on the exhibition catalog, settling on Frida Kahlo with Frida Rivera in parentheses underneath. By mid-October, a total of 25 artworks had arrived at the gallery. Levy's press release noted that Kahlo's paintings combine a Native American quality, which is naive, an unusual female frankness and intimacy, and a sophistication, which is the surrealist element. The paintings are in the Mexican tradition, painted on metal, and framed in charming Mexican peasant frames of glass and tin. Breton contributed an introduction to the catalog in which he called her paintings pure surreality and described her art as resembling a ribbon around a bomb. Her exhibition opened on November 1st, 1938, coincidentally on the Mexican Day of the Dead celebration. The response was phenomenal. Critics at the New Yorker, Art News, Art Digest, Vogue, Time, and virtually every other New York City newspaper covered the exhibition. Kala was on hand throughout the exhibition, dressed in her colorful Tawantepec garb, her heavy antique beads, and with her long black hair braided and entwined with ribbons. Levy was thrilled when he was able to sell six of her paintings. And he was also mesmerized by Kahlo herself. At some point during her time in New York City, Kahlo and Levy began an affair. And Levy photographed her in his Greenwich Village apartment, nude from the waist up, while she arranged her coiffure in a choreographed ritual he later described as a fantastic liturgy. He escorted her on ramblings throughout the city, and although Paula was plagued by an abscess on her right foot that bothered her tremendously. One night, on the spur of the moment, Levy and Kahlo boarded a train headed for Pennsylvania, where they visited department store owner Edgar Kaufman Sr. in his recently built home, Falling Water, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. On January 14, 1939, Paula departed for Paris where Breton had promised to mount another exhibition of her work, but she came away from that experience disappointed and disillusioned. After returning briefly to New York City in late March, she then departed from Mexico the following month. 
As you probably know, Kahlo's life would be filled with many, many health and relationship complications and unrelenting physical pain over the coming years. <clears throat> she and Levy did see each other again on at least two occasions, and in many of Levy's letters to her, he vigorously promoted the idea of a second exhibition of Kahlo's work. While she always responded in the affirmative, the truth was that she could not afford to accumulate enough paintings for an exhibition. Instead, to support herself and pay her medical bills, she was forced to sell most of her paintings as she completed them, one at a time, to interested individuals. The last painting she sent to Levy was one completed in 1943. However, their correspondence continued until 1947, and despite broken promises on both sides, her letters to Levy and his to her were always filled with fond memories, shared confidences, and tender expressions of love and friendship. Beth and I are delighted to announce that we have been able to include both sides of their previously unpublished correspondence in our book. So it makes for some fascinating reading. Ma Cabot Morgan, a descendant of the Boston Cabots, had her first solo exhibition at the Julian Levy Gallery in mid-November 1938. Likely due to Morgan's family connections, virtually every newspaper and art journal covered the opening, and the show garnered excellent reviews. Morgan's second Levy Gallery exhibition, again titled Paintings by Ma Morgan, opened on October 13, 1942. Included in the show were 20 paintings, including Musical Squash, which was acquired by Morgan's friend, Mrs. Nathan Todd Porter, for $200, and subsequently donated to the Museum of Modern Art. The exhibition Marilla Lednica Sculpture opened at the Levy Gallery at the end of November 1938. After her exhibition, the Polish sculptress was commissioned to create works for two churches in New Jersey, and her limestone statue of St. Anthony of Padua still stands near a brook behind St. Bridget Catholic Church in Peapath. Ione Ruth Robinson was living in Manhattan in the spring of 1938 when she learned that General Franco was on the verge of installing his fascist regime in Spain. On July 9th, she wrote, If I were a man, I would volunteer as a soldier and fight for the Spanish Republic. Being a woman and an artist, I feel that what I should do is grow. Robinson traveled to Barcelona in September 1938. Shocked to find the city in ruins and food supplies virtually non-existent, she began sketching and photographing in orphanages and hospitals. In early November, she flew to Berlin just in time to witness Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when the Nazis unleashed a wave of anti-Semitic violence in Germany. After returning to New York City, Robinson was repeatedly asked to give eyewitness accounts of the recent atrocities she had witnessed in both Spain and Germany. The extensive press coverage may have been what caused Julian Levy to offer 28-year-old Robinson her first solo exhibition in New York City. On December 9th, drawings by Ione Robinson, Spain, 1938, went on display at the Levy Gallery. The exhibition included 30 of Robinson's drawings and paintings depicting the plight of those widowed and orphaned by the Spanish Civil War. A reporter for the New York Times found them extremely effective, writing, it is tremendously sympathetic work by an artist with a true flair for the media. Although Irene Rice Pereira and her husband were divorced, she continued to use his surname and only the initial of her first name in signing her paintings, likely because she believed they would not be taken seriously if art collectors knew a woman had created them. Paintings and collages by I. Rice Pereira went on display at the Leafy Gallery in February 1939. The orange-hued cover of the exhibition catalog included simple graphics with two right angles dividing the cover into geometrical sections, a reference to the geometry of her paintings. Inside was a listing of the 15 canvases that were on display, 
including Pereira's Curves and Angles, which was also exhibited in 1940 during the New York World's Fair. Born in what is now Serbia, Milena Popovic Pereira, known professionally only by her first name, was a distant cousin to King Alexander I of Yugoslavia. During the summer of 1939, Milena decided to travel to the United States, perhaps hoping to find work in the magazine world. Sometime after arriving in New York, she met Julian Levy, who offered her a solo exhibition. Levy prepared a press release touting Milena's patrician background and informing viewers that, although this was her first American exhibition, she had already shown her work in various European cities. Paintings and portraits by Milena went on view at the Levy Gallery in March 1940. The exhibition catalog featured her painting of a starry landscape on the cover. Correspondence between Levy and Milena indicates that they discussed a second exhibition, but never agreed on a mutually favorable date. By the time Tamara <coughs> Kulampika held her exhibition at the Levy Gallery, she had already achieved considerable fame for her daringly sensual paintings of Parisian high society. Paintings by Tamara de Lumpica, Baroness de Kuffner, opened in April 1941 and included were 22 of de Lumpica's paintings and several drawings. The catalog cover featured the painting Wisdom, which depicted a young woman wearing a turban and reading a book. No expense was spared to make the exhibition a memorable event, and the opening night cocktail party, uh, at the opening night cocktail party, Dylan Pickett took the opportunity to be photographed standing in front of her mother's superior painting with Dolly at her side. Howard Debris, Debris at the New York Times described the excesses of the event in bitingly sarcastic terms, writing, a kind of secular cathedral air has been induced through the darkening, rearranging, and spotlighting of the Julian Levy Gallery. A peasant girl with beautifully tinted fingernails is my candidate for the most insipid picture. <laughs> Over the ensuing years, Dylan Pika became better known for her designer gowns and eccentric behavior than for her talent as an artist. Dylan Pika died in 1980 in Puerto Vaca, Mexico, and would have been astounded to know that her 1932 painting, Portrait of Marjorie Ferry, set a new auction record for her work in February of 2020, selling for $22.1 million at Christie's sale of Impressionist and Modern Art. And she's coming to Broadway in the spring. There's a play, so I'm so excited. English-born Catherine Yarrow fled to New York City during World War II. Her first solo exhibition, Ceramics by Catherine Yarrow, was on view at the Levy Gallery in May 1943 in conjunction with a show of bird-related collages and drawings by Max Ernst. Art News proclaimed that it was Bird Month at the Julian Levy Gallery and described Yarrow's work as distinguished pottery, handsomely decorated with fanciful bird abstractions. In the autumn of 1943, Sandy Cage began seeing a psychiatrist to help her adjust to her inevitable divorce from avant-garde composer John Cage. And during this period, she began to craft rather delicate mobiles, different from Calder's in that they were lighter, feminine, and made not of metal, but of wood strips with insets of paper. Perhaps encouraged by Ernst and Duchamp, Levy decided to give the first solo showing of Cage's constructions. Julian and Zenia designed, designed a clever single sheet catalog that doubled as a template for a do it yourself mobile, made by cutting the paper along pre drawn outline, outlines and threading together the pieces. Exhibition of Mobiles by Zenia Cage went on view in December 1943 consisting of 11 mobiles, which Levy would later describe as abstractions of the marriage between a kite and a canoe. <laughs> In the spring of 1944, Duane mounted partially concurrent shows of two painters who were a couple in real life. 
Dorothea Tanning, and Max Ernst. In fact, Julian had played an important role in bringing the two artists together. So it was quite fitting that their exhibitions would partially coincide at his gallery. Tannen had been working as a commercial artist when Julian came to her apartment sometime in late December 1941 or early 1942. Impressed with the two paintings she showed him, he immediately offered to give her an exhibition as soon as she had completed enough canvases. Years later, she reflected on how she had looked forward to displaying her paintings in his gallery, writing, Of all the gallery activity on 57th Street, where everything happened in those days, it was the Julian Levy Gallery that was truly making art history, the place where it was at. The prospect of seeing one's own work on its walls was, well, breathtaking. Finally, in the late spring of 1942, Levy had invited Tanning to a cocktail party, and it was there that she met Max Ernst. Unhappily married to heiress Peggy Guggenheim, Ernst was fascinated by Tanning, and within a few months, he and Tanning had begun an affair. On April 1st, 1944, Tanning's long-awaited solo exhibition, titled simply Dorothea Tanning, opened at the Levy Gallery and remained on view through April 29th. Tanning designed an exhibition announcement which depicted the elongated shadow of a woman standing in front of a closed door and reaching skyward. And her drawing for the cover of the exhibition catalog reflected the topography of Sedona, Arizona. Max Ernst, whose show opened three weeks later, wrote an admiring introductory essay for his life's catalog. Among the 20 canvases shown in the exhibition was a portrait of Muriel Levy, Julian's second wife, painted by Tanning in 1943. In fact, this was really a double portrait in which Muriel's head appeared partially enveloped by a billowy, transparent membrane that echoed the shape of Julian Levy's profile. Mm -hmm. After several postponements, Tanning's second exhibition at the Leafy Gallery opened on January 6, 1948. 23 canvases were shown, and the reviews were stunningly positive. Art News described Tanning as one of the most gifted young surrealists. Her second show fulfills the promise of the first. Miss Tanning's visions are personal and real. They speak of the child's lost safety and an adult's open terrors. No less impressive, though in a more playful mood, are such small pictures as Max in a Blue Boat, a charming portrait in a bright fairyland. In addition to painting, Tanning began working in various mediums for the rest of her long life, including collages, works on paper, and soft sculptures. She also devoted much of her time to writing, and in an interview in 2004, Crowley called herself the oldest living emerging poet. <laughs> <laughs> the intrepid Dorothy Tanning died in 2012 at the age of 101, having outlived every one of her art poems. Soon after her marriage, she came to Earl Miller in 1935. Henrietta Myers began signing her work using the name Peter Miller because she was convinced that collectors and critics would take her paintings more seriously if they thought a man had created them. Her first solo exhibition in New York City, titled Paintings by Peter Miller, was on view at the Levy Gallery in May 1944. Twenty-two works were shown, several of them based on the design motifs used by the Native Americans who lived in Miller's beloved San Ildefonso Pueblo, northwest of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Levy obviously thought Peter Miller was an artist with considerable potential, because he mounted a second showing of her work in October 1945, featuring 19 new paintings. The critic at Art News wrote, her recent canvases show her developing a more immediate expressiveness. Tokens of the change are impulsive drawing, sensuous color, succulent texture, freer design, and an occasional turning from symbolical space toward natural space. 
Catherine Lynn Sage, known as Kay, met fellow artist Yves Tanguy in Paris in 1938. She convinced him to flee with her to New York City in 1939 due to the threat of war. Sage and Tanguy were married in 1940 and subsequently moved to Woodbury, Connecticut. Recognizing Sage's aesthetic progress since her return to the U.S., Julian decided to show her work in October 1944. Simply titled Paintings by Kay Sage, the 18 works displayed were stark and refined, featuring great figures and geometrical backdrops that were both mysterious and majestic. The reviews were positive, but virtually all of them emphasized her marriage to Tangi instead of her talent as a painter. In October 1947, Sage's second exhibition at the Julian Levy Gallery, again titled Paintings by Kay Sage, went on view. This time her show consisted of 11 foils, all completed during the past year. Gone were the monolithic figures that had populated her previous paintings. Instead, only their draperies remained. Her ring of iron, ring of wool, was one of the first examples of this new approach in its lack of figural elements and triangular, off-kilter, umbrella-like structure, structures covered in fragments and shards. Yves Tanguy died suddenly in 1955 after suffering a cerebral hemorrhage. Sage ended her life in January of 1963. And among her belongings were several notes written in her ironic style. One explained her suicide as the means by which she sought to attain her ultimate destiny. The first painting by Eve that I saw before I knew him was called, I'm Waiting for You. Now he's waiting for me again. I'm on my way. <coughs> It is likely due to Levy's longtime friendship with Marcel Duchamp that he gave sculptor Maria Martins a solo exhibition in late November 1947. Martins, who went by the mononym Maria, was then married to the Brazilian ambassador to the United States. She had previously shown her sculptures in four other exhibitions mounted by Manhattan art dealer Valentine de Densing. But when he unexpectedly closed his gallery in the spring of 1947, she needed another venue where she could show her latest work. During the past three or four years, Maria had been involved in an intense, surreptitious affair with Duchamp. So he might have approached Levy on her behalf. Andre Breton was among her many admirers, and he contributed a lyrical essay to Levy's exhibition catalog. Many of her sculptures were inspired by Amazonian gods and goddesses who purportedly inhabit the Brazilian rainforest. By the time her exhibition ended in January 1948, Maria already knew she would soon be moving to Paris because her husband had recently been named the Brazilian ambassador to France. Her departure left Duchamp saddened and depressed, but he had a plan that would allow him to keep Maria with him for as long as he wished. That scheme involved assembling plaster casts he had made of her body and placing them into a three-dimensional setting that only he and Maria would understand. Perhaps many of you have visited the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where Duchamp's startling scenario, now titled A Tante Donnet, <coughs> is on display, turning viewers into voyeurs, just as Duchamp had intended. Julian Levy gave mosaicist Jean Renal her first solo <coughs> exhibition in New York City. Appropriately, it was scheduled to partially coincide with a memorial exhibition for her close friend, Marshall Borky. Mosaics by Jean Renal went on view in late October, 1948. Included were 16 mosaics, and the show received positive attention from the press. Levy chose one of the mosaics for himself, this one on the screen, which he would display in his Bridgewater, Connecticut home until his death in 1981. And that's it. <laughs>